further ado, I have to give uh, the uh, time and floor to Mr. Graham Watt, professor and uh, general practitioner from uh, uh, Glasgow. Please, uh, Mr. Watt, the Thank you very much. The I need to screen share. It will be reassuring to know that you can see my screen. We can see your screen. Very good. The, uh, okay, I'm just going to get rid of the pictures of the people. Well, th thank you very much for the invitation uh, and for listening to me in English. Uh, if only your King Hakon IV hadn't lost the Battle of Largs, in 1263, only 30 miles from where I'm sitting, I might be speaking to you in Norwegian, but alas, it wasn't to be. Now, the Scottish Deep End Project has given identity, voice, shared activity, shared learning and policy impact to a previously neglected group of general practitioners and by proxy the patients they serve. And it's my pleasure to share that experience with you. If, uh, there we are. Now this slide divides the Scottish population into 10 groups along the bottom with just over half a million people in each group, most affluent on the left, most deprived on the right. Premature mortality in blue and multimorbidity in red increase over two and a half fold across the spectrum. But funding in black is broadly flat, especially in the more deprived half of the population. Consultation rates in green rise a little, about 20%, but with no extra resource, this is only achieved by GPs in deprived areas in the bottom right-hand corner, having shorter consultations, or working a longer day. Indeed, a research study showed that GP consultations in deprived areas were shorter, dealt with more multimorbidity and social complexity, had lower expectations and poorer outcomes, especially for patients with mental health problems, and were associated with higher GP stress, sometimes called the inverse care law, not as an abstraction, but as the daily reality of patients and doctors. If you turn that slide upside down and go to the middle, you see where we got the idea of a deep end of a swimming pool, never getting to the bottom of things. And from this, the deep end logo. With the deep end of a pool, the steep slope of need, the flat line of resource, a sunrise or a sunset, depending on your disposition. Top left, a thistle for Scotland. Down the side, a spurtle or stirring kitchen instrument for stirring porridge. The whole thing's a flag for rallying under. And now there are similar flags in Ireland, in Australia and six areas of England, plus possible projects coming in Canada, the US and Belgium. It's, it's catching. I want to ask, what can deep end GPs do and what can be done to help them? Our first step was to listen to what they had to say at a conference in 2009 involving GPs from practices serving the 100 most deprived communities in Scotland. That's about 10% of all practices. Two thirds of practices were represented. It was the first time they'd ever been convened or consulted by anyone. The seating plan was a circle with everyone in the front row. The conference report captured their experience and views and set the agenda for a series of roundtable discussions on specific topics, 
all with short and long reports on the Deep End website at Glasgow University, the latest, number 36 at the bottom, addressing general practice in the time of COVID. Some of the reports have been about austerity, about welfare benefits, alcohol pricing, using the experience and voice of general practitioners to highlight social issues as they affect patients. But Deep End advocacy has mostly been about healthcare, because if healthcare is not at its best where it is needed most, inequalities in health will widen. And as healthcare has become more effective, the implications of inequity have become more important for public health. All this gave rise to the six point deep end manifesto. More time for consultations addressing the inverse care law, better use of serial encounters staying long enough to make a difference, building local health systems with general practice as the natural hub, better sharing of experience and learning, better support from the centre, stronger leadership at every level, especially ground level. Every point a challenge to current distributions of power and resource. Not every GP signs up for this. My colleague Brianen Babel, now back in the States, interviewed GPs working in deprived areas in Glasgow. All saw their role in clinical consultations. Some saw no further than that, whilst others tuned in to patients' social situations, viewed the local community as a resource, saw the social and political determinants of poor health being played out in front of them and wanting to do something about it. Engagement and listening were the first steps, but only a start. Keeping the initiative going required coordination usually from an academic department of family medicine, but could be by anyone known and trusted by practitioners. And with a network of interested practices, we were also ready to take on projects showing what we could, what, how we could make a difference. Because advocacy isn't just what you say, it's also what you do. I'll very briefly describe five projects, the details on the website. In a randomized controlled trial, the CARE Plus study showed that extended consultations for selected patients with complex problems is cost effective. Not so much improving patients quality of life on the left as on the right, preventing its further decline in the control group. The Govan Ship Project has nothing to do with ships, although Govan is where some famous ships were built. Long-term GP locums made it possible to give every GP in the health centre one protected session per week to use as they saw fit. Most used the knowledge to select patients who needed more consult consultation time, sorting and prioritising their problems, re-coordinating their care, driving integrated care from the bottom up via enhanced multidisciplinary team meetings with attached social care workers and community link workers. Focusing in this way on about 8% of practice patients also reduced GP workload for the practices as a whole. The community link worker program provided an extra person in the practice team, acting not only as a signpost to community resources, sometimes called social prescribing, but also working one-to-one -one with patients, especially patients struggling to cope with complicated and fragmented health and social care arrangements. At the Parkhead Health Centre, in the shadow of the Celtic football stadium, financial advice workers who were embedded in the practice and not simply working nearby, increased the number of new referrals for welfare benefits with an average financial benefit per referred patient of over £7,000 per annum, to which they were entitled. And finally, the Deep End Pioneer Scheme puts young GPs into deprived practices, partly to add clinical capacity, but also to release the time of experienced GPs 
so that they can apply their knowledge and experience to service development. The GP fellows are also engaged in service development and have a fortnightly day release scheme to meet their educational needs, filling the gaps not covered by conventional GP training. Learning from all these activities is shared between fellows, GPs and practices on a website. So in this way, we've been working through many of the active ingredients of primary care development, especially longer consultations, GP protected time, embedded co-workers, community links, academic support, collegiality. A consistent theme has been the importance of clinical generalists, providing unconditional personalized continuity of care for patients, whatever problem or combination of problems they present. In Scotland, link workers and financial advisors in blue, are now being embedded in all deprived practices, our major successes. The pioneer scheme has stopped in Scotland, but is being copied in other places. We are still arguing for the rollout of longer consultations and GP protected time. At a conference in Glasgow in 2019, we celebrated progress with the publication of a book, The Exceptional Potential of General Practice with 55 contributors from 11 countries, 44 of them general practitioners. The idea of the book is that medical students and, young, and not so young doctors would say, yes, that's what I do. Yes, that's what I want to be part of. Yes, that's the direction I want my career to go. There's now been four deep end international bulletins, each with 40 pages of news and views from the various deep end projects. Website at the bottom. The primary motivation of most deep end GPs is not to address the abstraction of health inequalities, but rather to improve patient care, closing the gap between what they are able to do and what they could do with more time and resource. This is partly about evidence, but it's also about values. I shadowed a GP, shown here, in Scotland's most deprived general practice, observing her day from seven in the morning to seven in the evening. I wrote it up in the BJGP. I saw multi-morbidity in large measure, and not simply the counting of conditions, but the number, severity, complexity, and continuing nature of health and social problems in families and households producing a succession of complicated stories. I saw the importance of prior knowledge and experience, allowing consultations to start at a higher level and without which less, much less could be achieved in a short consultation. I saw the importance of empathy and trust and the trust patients placed in the doctor who knew them well and cared what happened to them. I saw no worried well patients but I saw a worried doctor using her better knowledge to anticipate and try to prevent complications. She was ambitious for what might be achieved, not immediately, but over time. Every patient mattered. In Tales of the Thousand and One Nights, Scheherazade had to invent a new story every day. Her life depended on it. That is also the task of primary care, helping to create strong patient stories. Every practice is a compendium of such stories, but are they long stories or short stories, fairy stories or horror stories, who knows? An important part of story building is boosting patients' knowledge, confidence and agency without which self-help and self-management are destinations, not starting points. It's a shared journey at an appropriate pace. In Julian Tudor Hart's words, initially face to face, shifting slowly to side by side. Not every patient needs that, but in Scotland, and I expect in Norway too, the 10% of patients with four or more conditions who account for a third of unplanned admissions to hospital and a half of potentially preventable unplanned admissions to hospital certainly do. 
Patients with multimorbidity are all different. There's no simple case definition, but their needs are the same. Unconditional personalized continuity of care from a small team of providers whom they know and trust. Relationships are the silver bullets of general practice and primary care, but not just relationships with patients. The intrinsic strengths, sorry, the intrinsic strengths of family medicine general practice are first contact, continuity, population coverage, coordination, flexibility, long-term relationships and trust. These features are not exclusive to general practice, but very few public services have them in such large degree. They make general practice the natural hub of local health systems. But hubs go nowhere unless connected via spokes to other services and community resources. Each spoke a relationship that needs to be built up and looked after. It follows that realizing the exceptional potential of general practice requires competence, not only in clinical consultations, but also in two practice-based building programs, neither based on bricks and mortar or fancy architecture, but on relationships. The first, building a compendium of patient narratives. The second, building strong health systems based on general practice hubs. The independence of individual general practices is an asset, providing huge scope for local initiative and enterprise, ownership and pride. But conversely, it's also a prescription for variation, inefficiency, inequity, and a weak collective voice. The equitable potential of general practice depends therefore on three types of accountability, upwards to funders, providing quality and value for money, downwards to patients and local communities addressing their needs, and sideways to other practices, ironing out inefficiency and inequity. So a third building program is needed based on the collegiality and solidarity of practices, which requires a variety of connecting infrastructure support from the center with resources commensurate to need, with information systems to measure omission and monitor progress, such as the balance between routine and emergency care, the quality of patient experience, the amount of social capital within local systems, educational opportunities to share experience and learning, research and evaluation to establish what works, career opportunities to attract and retain committed practitioners. These programs I have described are needed, of course, everywhere, pro rata, based on need. But if the healthcare system is not at its best where it's needed most, inequalities in health will widen. Healthcare is not a level playing field. Healthcare is built on a slope. And there are four cogent reasons for beginning at the bottom of the slope. First, as we advocated in this deep end report, number 20, by improving outcomes for individual patients and delivering such care for all patients, population health can be improved and inequalities in health narrowed. Addressing health inequalities is a consequence of such care rather than its starting point. Second, for health service managers, stronger care in the community can prevent, postpone, or lessen crises requiring emergency A&E attendance or hospital admission. Patients can pass through this gateway to A&E at any time, but when they have access to, to a primary care team they know and trust, when they are confident in their care arrangements, and when the complications of their conditions have been prevented, they choose not to. The beauty of this type of gatekeeping is that there is no gate. Third, for an increasing group of deep end practitioners, from newcomers to old hands, this is what they aspire to do with their careers. 
it's the direction they want to travel. And it's the collegiate culture they want to be part of. Here is the Scottish Deep End Steering Group meeting recently. Lots of young GPs, mostly women. They are the future and the beating heart of the project. But finally, and perhaps most important, it's what publicly funded doctors can contribute to the healing of society. The late John Berger wrote a seminal book about general practice called The Fortunate Man, but reviewing the work of the artist Frida Kahlo, he also wrote, in the dark age in which we are living in the new world order, I don't need to tell you what that is, the sharing of pain is one of the essential preconditions for a refinding of dignity and hope. Much pain is unshareable, but the will to share pain is shareable. And from that inevitably inadequate sharing comes a resistance. Healthcare can be part of that resistance. And we say that the common purpose of the Deep End projects is that by excluding exclusions, keeping everyone on board and building three types of relationship, inclusive healthcare can be a civilizing force in this increasingly dangerous, fragmented and uncertain world. Thank you.